What happens when the world's richest man, who fancies himself as a champion of free speech, buys a global brand that aspires to act as the planet's digital town square? There has been plenty of turmoil in the two weeks since Elon Musk completed his $44 billion purchase of Twitter. Now it's the U.S. president himself wondering aloud whether the keys to the tech giant's nearly 400 million users' personal data should be in the hands of a firm whose second largest investor is a Saudi prince, Saudi Arabia, hardly a champion of freedom of expression. With half of Twitter's 7,000-plus staff fired last Friday, one wonders how many of them were content moderators. Musk's unfiltered, unregulated approach to the tech industry by no means makes him an outlier. For years, Facebook, which also owns Instagram and WhatsApp, resisted any responsibility for the spread of disinformation. What about Google, China's TikTok, just to name a few others? As information wars rage over the war in Ukraine, France's rivalry with Russia and Africa, China's competition with the United States, who makes and enforces the rules of that digital town square that we're talking about? For example, uh, the digital town square that aspires uh, to include shows like this one, which seek to enlarge, uh, to engage with viewers like you from around the world. Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're looking at free speech, according to Elon Musk, with a social media and cyber warfare analyst, Fabrice Epelboin. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. From London, Connor Jewis, internet editor at tech news site Make Use Of. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Francois. Good to be here. From New York City, journalist Kyle Spencer, author of Raising Them Right, the untold story of America's ultra-conservative youth movement and its plot for power. Welcome to the show. Hi, it's nice to be here. And from Vilnius, we welcome back political analyst Alexandra Filipenko. How are you? Thank you for having me. Good, thank you. The France 24 debate still on Twitter and Facebook, the hashtag F24 debate. It's a question from a White House reporter at Wednesday's press conference where Joe Biden was hailing uh, the Democrats outperforming those low expectations in U.S. midterm elections. Does Elon Musk and his Saudi backers present a national security risk with Twitter? It's just one of the controversies in the past 24 hours alone. Inko Yatare has more. It's the latest move by Elon Musk to ruffle feathers since he took control of Twitter just two weeks ago. In his first email to employees at the social media giant, the millionaire ordered workers back to the office. Remote work is no longer allowed unless you have a specific exception. Managers will send the exception lists to me for review and approval. The announcement brings an end to the company's optional working from home policy implemented in the early months of the pandemic. Musk in the past has denounced the practice, saying it allows people to avoid hard work. The ban comes just days after the new owner slashed Twitter's workforce by half, firing 3,700 employees. Cuts Musk says he had no choice over, arguing the company had been hit by a massive drop in revenue. Several brands, including General Motors, have paused advertising on the platform over concerns that Musk's fierce advocacy of free speech will lead to a rise in hateful content on Twitter. In a bid to reassure advertisers, the billionaire held a Twitter space on Wednesday about his plans for content moderation on the platform. Meanwhile, that same day, US President Joe Biden brought up concerns of his own. Elon Musk's cooperation and or technical relationships with other countries uh, is worthy of being looked at. Whether or not he is doing anything inappropriate, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting that it's worth, worth being looked at. Saudi Prince Al-Walid bin Talal and his kingdom holding company have a $1.89 billion stake in Musk's $44 billion takeover of Twitter. Uh, Fabrice Pelboin, Al-Walid bin Talal, he's the owner of the uh, posh uh, Georges V Hotel here in Paris, co-owner of the Plaza Hotel in New York. Is this some kind of a security risk, a Saudi investment in Twitter? Uh, probably not as much as the 
United Arab Emirates sovereign fund because those guys are really good in cybersecurity, which is not the case of Saudi Arabia, and not to mention Binance, who is another stockholder and who is basically a major crypto Chinese company. So yes, there are some geopolitical troubles in the in Twitter's uh, shareholders. What, what does that mean? What are the risks exactly? What, what, what can they do with the data Nothing. of users? The, the, the shareholders do not have access to data because they are shareholders. But once you said that, everything is possible, especially censoring specific things in those specific countries. And basically, since Elon Musk wants to respect every single law every, uh, everywhere on Earth, well, free speech law in Saudi Arabia doesn't really exist. So they, um, Twitter might be not that useful in those regions of the world, whereas they used to be incredibly useful. In 2009, the first Iranian revolution, the Green Revolution, was Sparkle using Twitter. It probably won't be the case in the future. Probably won't be the case in the future. Uh, uh, Connor Jewis, do you agree? Uh, I would have to probably not agree, actually. Considering the fact that these shareholders from foreign countries have such a minor role, what was that 1.8% or less out of 44, um, 1.8 billion out of the 44 billion is relatively small stake. And as we were talking about, their shareholders don't have direct access to Twitter. In regards to free speech rules across the world, um, the EU president obviously tweeted that Elon Musk must follow the EU rules and. It's the same for every country, but ultimately content moderation policies are governed by the company itself. So that would really be down to the Twitter itself rather than any shareholders that have a claim in it. Uh, Kyle Spencer, uh, we understand you've just had an election where you are, uh, and you have to wonder if Elon Musk's coming under scrutiny from the Biden administration. It's got to be as well a factor, the fact that this billionaire has forayed into partisan politics with on the eve of the vote, this call over uh, Twitter to vote Republican. What was your reaction to that? Well, it really struck me as a bit of an abuse of the platform. I mean, this is a guy who is essentially now a billionaire who is in charge of the world's public square. And so it would suggest to me that if he's going to be this kind of nonpartisan moderator, he really shouldn't be on there actually expressing his own personal political views. It's kind of dangerous, but you know what else? It's also really unprofessional. Uh, un unprofessional, you say. At the end of the day, uh, he, he calls the shots, right? Yeah, he does call the shots, but I think that's kind of part of the problem is that you've got somebody who's in charge of the platform who can make very serious rules about what people can and cannot say on the platform. And then he's also using it to express his own views right at the, on the eve of an American election. I mean, that's that's really um, you've got to ask yourself what his motivation was to do that. Alexandra Filipenko. Yeah, I, I must say that um, Twitter is essential for American elections. And in order to follow American elections and American politics in general, uh, you have to follow politicians and everyone on Twitter. And uh, during the last electoral cycle, uh, I must say that they labeled, Twitter labeled some of the posts that were election related. And they pointed readers to some alternative information about electoral pro process or alert alerted readers that the information was misleading. And this time, in this election cycle, at least 26 candidates posted inaccurate or some misleading information, and nothing was labeled. And those were some of the candidates that won in the end. So this is very important right now. And especially, and I, I must note that uh, right now, uh, Georgia and uh, Arizona and Nevada are pivotal uh, for the Senate, for the race in the Senate. And uh, just two hours into the voting, uh, Washington Post reported that 400,000, four, so, sorry, 40,000, not that much, not 400, but 40,000 tweets about uh, voting machines with words like fraud, cheat, or cheating were posted in first hours uh, of election uh, so, uh, regarding Arizona, in, in talking about Arizona. So this is uh, quite nerve-wracking, actually, when we know that Twitter is so powerful in American political cycle and American election.
Uh, you're, you're, uh, I, I bring it back uh, to, to you again, Connor Jewis, on, on this. Uh, uh, again, we're, we're sort of in a 2020, as, as, as Alexandra was saying, we're sort of still in a 2020 scenario right now in, in, in the United States where you're still counting ballots in three crucial states uh, for the Senate. Yeah, that's correct. Well, I mean, touching on that first point about um, Elon's own tweet, um, just wanted to come back to that. Unprofessional, perhaps, but certainly not dangerous. I believe that as an individual himself on the platform, that he's doing exactly what a social media platform is there for, expressing his own views, his own opinions, whether that's voting Republican or um, Democrat, he's entitled to um, express that on the platform. And I believe that that's completely separate to his role. Um, heading up Twitter now. Uh, in fact, he didn't mention Twitter at all. It didn't come from any Twitter official account, came from his own personal account. So I believe that those two are separate enough to certainly not be classified as dangerous in, in the slightest. And in regards to content moderation in the current elections, um, Elon and the Twitter team themselves have cl actually clarified that they haven't changed any of the content moderation policies as of yet. So in fact, if people are not seeing these same warnings um, or redirections to misleading information, uh, sorry, away from misleading information, that could just be outliers or the fact that certain tweets aren't getting flagged because we, at, at, at this current time, Twitter themselves and Elon have confirmed that um, the content moderation policy hasn't changed and we have to accept that as but, a but, fact. But, but, but Connor, uh, we've seen reports that uh, among those 3,700 staff that were fired, there were content moderators. That is absolutely correct. The head of the trust team at Twitter actually tweeted out today that he estimates only approximately 15% of the content moderation um, team were laid off in the wide laid offs, which were 50% of the staff. So in a workforce of that size, 15% is purely on the, um, yeah, on the minority, not that much, as you say. Uh, not, not that much, says Fabrice uh, Epelboin. Uh, then there's the question of uh, certification. Uh, in the last hour, Elon Musk tweeting, quote, there are far too many corrupt legacy blue verification check marks. You have one of those? I have one of those. I have one of those, too. So does our, so does our show. Uh, no choice but to remove legacy blue in the coming months, uh, he tweeted. It's probably going to evolve in the coming days because it's, it's been a huge changes mess up. Changes every day. Basically, he throws an ID, people react, then he takes the reaction to account and he throws another ID and he will end up having something who hopefully will be clever and adapted to Twitter. The first ID of Elon Musk was totally stupid. The second ID, which was today's ID, was better, probably not perfect, but better. Uh, let's hope that tomorrow something better will show up in uh, Elon Musk's mind. Yeah, in the last two weeks, Elon Musk's, uh, uh, yeah, not only brought us mass laid offs, policies, and politics, he's changed his plan. Initially, it was to charge 30 but then $8 a month to have uh, those uh, uh, blue check marks. Uh, 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 now, uh, Musk uh, is. Uh, uh, saying uh, it's only $8. Uh, did he uh, buy Twitter, though, to conquer the world? Or, as some wonder, as a tax write-off, he has sold $4 billion worth of Tesla stock uh, in the past couple of weeks. He really has us guessing here, Kylie Spencer. Yeah, what his intentions are. I just want to go back to something that I think is extremely important. We're discussing misinformation and the spread of misinformation in the United States in general and also during an election. And then we're talking about a guy who said, who owns this platform now, who told people that he thought that they should go and support candidates from a party that is responsible for the misinformation. That's a huge problem. Fabrice Pelboin. I think we should be clear with the audience what the problem is. Uh, everybody's afraid that Twitter could hijack the current midterm election. And there's a very good reason for that, because the previous election in 2020 have been hijacked by Twitter. But 2020 that, or 2016? No, 2020, the one who showed uh, Joe, uh, Joe Biden as a president. Uh, a critical information was censored by Twitter under Twitter's authority, Prior to the election, you mean the, the canceling of Donald Trump's account? 
Uh, no, I, th uh, I think about the the New York Post articles about Hunter Biden. Uh, it was something like 10 days before the, the election. It was a critical information who could have had a major impact on the election, and it was censored because Twitter decided to censor it. Kyle Spencer? Yeah, I mean, listen, the Hunter Biden situation is extremely complicated. It's very unclear what the truth is there. Absolutely and again, the clear. very fact that we're discussing politics, information, misinformation, and the platform where this happens makes it really obvious that the person who now owns this platform should not be then involved in who, what candidate or what party a voter should vote for. And the very fact that he told voters to vote for, a, for candidates who have led a huge misinformation campaign that led to an insurrection, that's dangerous. Yeah, we're talking about 2022, 2020. Uh, we saw in uh, 2016, ahead of Donald Trump's election for a mere $100,000, Russia's internet research agency at the time, was able to reach 126 million users on Facebook, but also YouTube and Twitter. Uh, earlier this week, uh, they even made money at it, as NBC News reported. Earlier this week, the Daily Beast's Shannon Vavra reported that uh, Russia is no longer creating as many fake accounts. Uh, instead, uh, uh, Russian information operations have been latching on to pre-existing tensions and posts uh, to amplify them. Uh, mm. Alexandra Filipenko, uh, when we talk about how many moderators there are at Twitter and you look at uh, uh, Russia's strategy in all of this, what's your reaction? The first, actually, the first I thought, the first person I thought of was uh, Evgeny Prigozhin, and I think that he's the biggest winner here. And um, Kremlin generally is a big winner here because uh, talking about the integrity of elections, if we can trust or we cannot trust, or not us, but Americans, if Americans can trust or they uh, or should they uh, deny or question the legitimacy of the vote and all that talk on Twitter, it only uh, erodes, let's say, the foundation of American democracy in a way, this trust in the system. And this is a big win for the Kremlin. This is a great thing for the Kremlin because the Kremlin generally needs uh, Americans not to trust the elections. They need Americans to be concentrated on the elections and to fight within themselves and leave Ukraine alone and leave Russia to get as much of Ukraine territory as they can. So I must say that uh, in all that election denying, Kremlin generally is the big winner. So, Alexandra, how, how uh, do you blow back against that while respecting free speech? That's, that's the biggest question. That's very, very tricky because either you have have to check everyone, but you cannot check everyone's IDs or, or something like that. But probably there must be some new instruments for that, because uh, Mr. Prigozhin and his trolls, uh, as they are known online, they were very successful in Russia. They were very successful in the United States. They are currently very successful posing uh, or uh, acting as if they are Russian or Ukrainian and uh, t teasing and uh, well they they are disrupting and uh, they uh, there must be some probably some new technologies unfortunately I'm not a technology expert but there must be some way to check uh, check that you're shaking your head, Fabrice. Yeah, actually, there's been a huge leak of internal documentation in Facebook uh, a few months ago, uh, specifically about those tools, uh, artificial intelligence, in order to uh, assist moderation. And basically, Facebook engineer, and they are the best in the world, uh, estimate that those technology will be able to handle five, maybe 10% of the problematic content, no more. Uh, so there is no technological solution. It needs workforce, tons of workforce. So and does Alexandra's uh, laborious get everybody to register a solution, the only one? Uh, she says it's complicated. It's nearly impossible. Uh, you need tons of workforce. Uh, you need to be realistic about what's possible and what's not. And you need to be realistic about the, the, the impact so far that social network has done to the, uh, to the American democracy. Uh, those election, the, the Donald Trump's election and Joe Biden's election have been hijacked by social networks, Facebook and then Twitter. So basically, it's been two presidential elections hijacked 
by technology in the United States, and now we are seeing a debate whether the United States should restrict uh, free speech, which is basically the First Amendment. And as you know, uh, the Second Amendment is here to protect the first, and it's pretty frightening, at least from a European perspective. But this is what Second Amendment happen. being the right to bear arms. The right to form militia, bearing arms, in order to fight the state who is ha heading to your First Amendment. So basically it's called civil war in this context. That's what's at stake uh, in the United States. I mean, from a European point of view, but at least European point of view who's living in the United States, it seems really, really a dangerous time. Kyle Spencer, that brings us to the topic of your book, does it not? Uh, the, 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 uh, you you uh, uh, investigated uh, how uh, extremist movements uh, are working to indoctrinate uh, younger people. And uh, is it, as Fabrice describes it, technology that's leading the dance? Or is it human beings leading the dance? Well, in my book, uh, Raising Them Right, what I describe is a campaign to radicalize young people that started really on college campuses and then spread online because it was clear that uh, messaging online was faster, it was more efficient, and you could reach more yeah, people. Have this I think right the, technology, the technology is a tool to radicalize. But radicalizing really first starts with uh, convincing people that their rights are being taken away from them, that there is a huge free speech problem in the United States. And there's not a huge free speech problem in the United States. We have free speech and people are allowed to say what they want. We have a misinformation problem, which gets really tricky when you have democracy and when you have people trying to formulate ideas about what they believe in. Um, you know, so that's, that's the the thing. But I would say that what you found with right-wingers in the United States and the reason why technology works so well for them is because, A, they don't care about truth. It's not something that matters to them. And B, they message a lot of hate, resentment, anger, and that also does very well. So um, the, the social media landscape has been fabulous for radicalizing young people in general. Outrage uh, has always been the, the, the business model for uh for social media, Connor Jewish, what do you do? Sorry, could you repeat that question, please? I think you cut out a little bit there. I was saying outrage has always been the business model for social media. Uh, re re listening to what Kyle's saying about uh, how that's being utilized by uh, radical forces, what do you do when you're uh, the owner of a social media company? Absolutely. Um, outrage on both sides of the spectrum has always been a driving force behind not just social media, but all sorts of content. That comes back down to just individuals as themselves, both on the on the left and the right. We're seeing these sorts of radicalization and extremist content um, published on social media and throughout the media. Um, as touch upon there, social media is just the tool that is one of the technological tools that enables that through communication these days. That's not to say that the technology is inherently at fault, rather it's how it's being used. Uh, one way in preventing this is definitely down to verification of users, which is what's sort of been trying to be implemented with the $8 per month for the blue tick now. I don't think that's quite the approach, but the verification and ensuring users are real is the first step into ensuring that these um, types of problems don't continue to run rife on social media. Because when you listen to Alexandra Filipenko uh, describe how uh, the Russians uh, want to uh, sow discord in places like the United States, the United Kingdom and, and elsewhere, uh, how, what do you do when it comes to that verification? Um, as I think everybody said here, it's certainly not a uh, simple solution. There are con content moderation um, teams. Uh, Twitter still has some 15% loss, still 85% of the content moderation team are there who can manually review posts, um, remove misinformation, add flags. Well, not it fast enough, to though, says misinformation as well, but that's... Uh... Excuse me? Not fast enough, says uh, Fabrice Pelloin. Uh, perhaps, but that's um, where artificial intelligence tools come in, who can pick up some of the slack there. And if we're verifying who people are before they're signing up or with existing accounts as well, then this becomes um, less of an issue. Last month, uh, Elon Musk denied that uh, he had told geopolitics consultant Ian Bremmer 
that he'd spoken with Vladimir Putin and the Kremlin directly about uh, Ukraine. Uh, this, as Musk suggested, Kiev sue for peace and give up claims uh, to Crimea. Brings us back to what Kyle was saying earlier about uh, the heads of the companies like this weighing into politics. Now, at a tech conference in Portugal uh, earlier this month, Ukraine's Minister of Digital Transformation continued to voice thanks for Musk's Starlink low-orbit satellites. Invaluable, he says, for keeping Ukrainians online, on the internet, since the start of the war. Uh, for now, there is no problem with Starlink. There are 20,000 of them working in Ukraine, and Elon Musk told me personally they will continue to support Ukraine and to provide Starlink to Ukraine. Sorry to ask the question so bluntly, Alexandra Filipenko, but what do Ukrainians think of Elon Musk? Well, I think for now, the main uh, thing for Ukrainians is to win. It's, it is the most important thing. And uh, for now, Elon Musk's technologies allow Ukrainians to win city by city. And even today, we saw big wins uh, by, by Ukrainians gaining uh, back, uh, getting back their own territory. So for now, this is the most important thing. And uh, regarding him talking on Twitter and saying something and uh, uh, maybe advising uh, the, the start of elect, the, the negotiations or talking about negotiations, th this is not that important for them right now. I think they understand that as of now, while there's fighting, they they have this American policy, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, and they're sure that the United States would not move in any other direction. I, I think so, I, I pro most probably. So for now, they do not take note of those things that Elon Musk is saying. Uh, I must say that in Russia, Russian news outlets, they all talked about what Elon Musk said, and they, they uh, it, quoted him all the time, so many times they quoted him. But in Ukraine, they don't seem to care that much of his Twitter feed. They only care about Starlink and his actual factual help, not, of this, not uh, about his words. Not about his words. Uh, and uh, when uh, uh, we have Elon Musk uh, w w with Twitter there, uh, whose uh, words are being closely watched uh, in one place, and that's Brussels, to hear uh, Europe's internal market commissioner, Thierry Breton, uh, tell it. Uh, it could be the EU uh, to uh, the rescue. This was the tweet he put out on the day that uh, Musk completed that uh, 44 uh, billion uh, do uh, euro dollar purchase, excuse me, dollar purchase uh, of uh, the uh, of uh, of uh, Twitter. Uh, and you see uh, the hashtag there, uh, Fabrice Pelboin, uh DSA. That's uh, explain what DSA is for our Digital viewers. Service Act. It's basically a law that will help people like Twitter and Facebook to moderate uh, their content according to the European law. There's lots of other things, but when it comes to Facebook and Twitter, basically they will have very tight obligation in terms of uh, moderation. Because at the outset of our conversation, you seem to be saying that, okay, in the US, they've got their rules with the First Amendment and the right to free speech. Here in Europe, we've got our rules. Oh, here in France, we've got our rules. But in Poland, they have different rules. And in Italy, they have another set of rules. And in Hungary, they... So can a social media giant abide by all the rules? Honestly, I have no idea he's going to do this. But it's the same thing for Facebook, same thing for TikTok, same thing for everybody. Nobody knows how, with, especially with ad revenues, ad revenues are not enough to buy content moderation. This is one of the reasons uh, Elon Musk is trying to find other revenues, like premium subscription. But basically, with only ad revenues, there is absolutely no way you can buy yourself content moderation that will hold up to the DSA. It's impossible. They will have problems every single day. How does Elon Musk, uh, how is he going to solve this? Nobody knows. But he definitely has a plan because six months ago, he started working with Thierry Breton, the EU commissioner, uh, about the DSA. And he's been working with his team and Thierry Breton's team for the past six months. So definitely they have a big picture. They know what, well, it looks like they could know what they're doing, but nobody really knows what he's doing. Does but he's been really working hard on it. Does Connor Jewis know? 
Uh, no, certainly not. I would certainly not, um, not claim to know. Um, all honesty, I'm not sure that there is a formal plan at Twitter. But in terms of abiding by different rules in different places, we've already seen that sort of thing before uh, in regards to the GDPR laws and regulations uh, over in the US, um, data protection and everything to do with GDPR is com managed completely differently and when you come over here to, to Europe and the UK there are different sets of rules, different sets of agreements, different sets of terms of service that users have to agree to and abide by. We've seen it been done before in regards to that so we know that it is possible in regards to each individual country having their own rules perhaps that's harder to, harder to implement but we know that it, it can be done. Okay, we're talking about two very different things, content moderation, cyber security. Uh, very, very, very different thing. Uh, the major problem with content moderation is that there is no magical technology. Artificial intelligence is not going to solve the problem. There has been proven. You need workforce, huge workforce, and you mean methodology and a way to cooperate with justice. And so far, neither Twitter nor Facebook nor TikTok has achieved this. Nobody knows how they're going to do this, but really, trust me, you need only human workforce. There is no magical technology. There might be some magical technology within 10 years, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen next year. Until then, you will need lots of people looking at those content and doing content moderation because this DSA package is really, really tight. All right, and then there's the question of whether the free market uh, could be the ultimate arbiter uh, since Musk's purchase of Twitter, half a million users have flocked to Mastodon. That's a non-profit open source social media founded by a 20-something German-born software developer back in uh, 2016. Uh, Kyle Spencer, uh, we're talking about a digital town square at the beginning of the conversation, a place where the whole planet can come for a conversation. Um, if you've got Mastodon on one side, uh, Donald Trump's uh, social media, it's Truth Social uh, on the other, uh, and Twitter, uh, it, 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 is it going to be everyone speaking in their own bubble even more? Yeah, I think that's the biggest issue right now for folks who use Twitter as a way to communicate their point of view and also to gather information, to have a, a public conversation. Folks who are concerned about how much Elon Musk is going to moderate um, the truth and non-truth and how much he's going to allow the escalation of rage, hate and lies, those people who are concerned about it definitely want to get off the platform. But the fear is if you get off the platform and you take your views somewhere else, they won't be heard on this platform and you won't be able to combat the untruths. So it's really tricky. And I have to I think a lot of folks and they're saying this on, you know, you hear this a lot of users are actually expressing this on Twitter is that they don't know what to do. And for many of them, the answer right now for particularly for political influencers on the left, the answer is to stay there and to try to figure it out and to kind of hope that they will be able to communicate with users and communicate their views uh, and not feel like they have to flee and let Twitter be a place where it's just people who are not that interested in truth. Uh, yeah, I've noticed, by the way, that, uh, Kyle, that uh, since the midterm election results, uh, shares in Truth Social ha have nosedived. Is there a cautionary tale for Twitter? You know, it's un it's just unclear to me what's going to happen with all of these different platforms. I think that there is going to there's got to be a solution here. Like somebody has got to have to figure out a way to find a platform or at least to moderate these platforms enough so the truth is what is being discussed. Um, and again, I don't think there's an answer for it yet, but I think at some point the public is really going to want that. And I just want to go back to what I said before. The biggest issue about moderating these platforms and Elon Musk is whether or not he really cares himself about moderating them and whether or not he cares about truth being on these platforms. And he reruns this thing now. So I think the biggest question is, what are his motivations? What are his motivations? Alexandra Filipenko, your thoughts on this? Well, this is a very interesting question. Actually, when I first uh, read what he said about Ukraine, first I thought, oh, well, he wasn't born in the United States, so he cannot run for president. But maybe it's some kind of political ambition over there. 
can can we think that it's a political ambition? Maybe he would like to be in American politics somehow. But uh, that's the first thing, actually, that I thought of, that uh, maybe his motivations are something more than we know. And he is uh, now he's the trickster. He he took uh, Donald Trump's place in Twitter, in a way, uh, when uh, Donald Trump was the, the biggest trickster on Twitter, but now it's Elon Musk. And maybe his ambitions are more than just being a businessman right now. But Or, or it just seems this way, because, of course, I'm very focused on Ukraine and Russia and everything that's going on around. Uh, let me ask you, Connor Jewis, why did Elon Musk buy Twitter? He himself said he um, he's bought it in in a bid to improve the platform and make a better um, town square for the people and just to generally improve uh, humanity, I believe, was the quote that he said himself. In terms of his own um, motivations for content moderation, he has uh, uh, said multiple times uh, over the past few days and the past few months that while he's a free speech absolutist, he wants the far left and the far right to be equally um, upset. He wants content moderation to be down the middle, not leaning towards um, the left nor to the right in terms of um, political views. So I think that we can expect uh, that sort of result because he's made it publicly clear that that's his intention. Fabrice Appelboin. Well, first of all, if you have $44 billion to invest, there is a much more profitable way to spend your money than buying Twitter. Twitter never made profit. So it's definitely a political move. It's an international political move. He's definitely into geopolitics. Without Starlink, there wouldn't be anything left in Ukraine because they needed definitely needed to communicate. There are two very disruptive technology in this war. And again, Drones, Starlink is, are those low orbit low satellites orbit satellite. that are helping uh, Ukrainians get the internet. It's basically an ISP, except it's satellite. And it's extremely easy to use. And without it, there wouldn't be any communication in Ukraine. And the Ukrainian army would probably de be defeated. And sorry to say that. Uh, without drones, this war would have a totally different shape. And drones, so far, until Iran, really helped the Ukrainian side. So basically, uh, Twi uh, Elon Musk is a very big part of what's at stake in Ukraine. Very, very big part. With Twitter, he's buying something that will enable him to be a global political actor. And he's definitely buying that. He's not buying this for the money. He's not. He has enough money, $230 billion. I mean, you can have... One zero dot one percent of this, you would still be among the richest men in the world. He doesn't need more money, and he, he basically doesn't really spend his money for his leisure. The guy lives in his office, literally. He, who is going to keep on working 90 hours a week once he succeeded at free huge company and he's already the, the most uh, richest man in the world? Okay, uh, so if you're those French and European regulators, in light of what you've just said, how do you treat Elon Musk? Basically, like a country who's living in my own country and who, who controls part of my public... He doesn't control my public opinion as a, a French citizen. He controls the infrastructure that makes the public opinion possible. It's a huge power, something like that. We never witnessed this before. The previous generation of billionaires willing to have an impact on public opinion used to buy media and then kind of try to control media in order to have an impact on public opinion. Here we're talking about networks, the way information goes from one uh, individual to another, and he controls this. So he could do possibly huge things. If you look at what Prigozhin uh, is doing in Africa right now, Prigozhin is, uh, is, is uh, the, the, the CEO Blue. of the trolling factory in, in uh, St. Petersburg. Um, he, and he has been incredibly successful because he also has a, a Wagner group. So he has uh, some sort of militia for hire, gun for hires, and those trolls. And in Africa right now, they're incredibly successful at ousting French from every former colony. Uh, within five years, if he succeeds, uh, we won't be in Africa anymore. It's incredibly efficient. So uh, Elon Musk is buying this. Maybe this is going to change because so far, and I want to sense that this is mostly on Facebook more than Twitter, but still, Prigozhin is also using Twitter. And the effects has been really catastrophic. Uh, I kind of think that Elon Musk could 
probably improve the situation. I uh, hope he will. The, Alexander Filipenko, there are millions of West Africans today who are convinced that uh, the French are uh, in cahoots with the jihadists in Mali. Uh, it's unsubstantiated completely. Uh, is uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin uh, the culprit here, or is it Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk? Oh, well, Yevgeny Prigozhin has always been very active in Africa, and he was very interested in the region generally, and he started there, actually. Uh, he, first, he was known as uh, uh, President Putin's own own uh, cook, and now he has a private army. And actually, Wagner is a huge army. And one of the thoughts that a lot of Russian political analysts have right now is that he might be aiming for the presidency, actually, because he's acting the way that probably he's only reporting to President Putin right now. And I really, it, it doesn't give me any pleasure, but I would like to quote Yevgeny Prigozhin, because he I, he said this in, in Russian, and I just translate, uh, I will answer you very uh, delicately, and I apologize, I will allow a certain ambiguity. We interfered, we interfere, and we will interfere in the elections. Carefully, precisely, surgically, in our own way, just as we know how, during our targeted operations, we will remove both kidneys and the liver at once. And this is him saying and answering to the question whether his companies or whether Russians can somehow be a part of uh, the elections right now. So he basically says that, yes, we will uh, delicately uh, somehow interfere. And definitely he is interfering in Africa and he's very active and Wagner is very active in Africa. This is one of their main goals right now. Kyle Spencer, this brings us back to the clip we heard at the beginning of our conversation, uh, a White House reporter asking the president of the United States if a social medium presents a national security threat. What have we learned in the six years since the 2016 election? Well, I think we've learned that misinformation has become a, a bigger and bigger problem, that the folks who do this kind of misinformation and spread lies about election fraud and whether or not the election was um, accurate in 2020 um, have just continued to grow. Now, in 2016, you you know, after, after Trump was elected, he brought in social media experts and social media uh, celebrities to the White House to uh, congratulate them and to increase their platforms and to let him then know that he understood that they had a tremendous amount of power. I think that in the United States, uh, what we've seen is that, that liberals, the left, has had a harder time grasping how to use social media to its benefit. I think that's going to change, but it hasn't changed yet. And the biggest threat, I think, to social media in the United States is if the liberals, if the left, if the Democrats cannot figure out how to effectively and uniformly message online and let the, the right, which messages inaccurately, uh, and I have to say much more than the right does, there's not parity here, I do not accept that there's parity. But the problem will continue until the Democrats learn how to message effectively. Once they do, I think we'll have less problems. Connor Jewis in the UK, is it the same dynamic? Uh, we saw the disinformation during the Brexit campaign in 2016 as well. Uh, absolutely. Disinformation and misinformation is um, growing and spreading across social media. But the key issues around that is in defining the, the misinformation, with uh, information changing continuously, especially throughout the pandemic. Um, it becomes harder and harder to, to moderate this content when, when, when the facts themselves are changing. Um, it's certainly a hard job to do to moderate both misinformation from, from the left uh, and from the right. So, Fabrice Pelboin, uh, right now, I'm still haunted by what you said earlier, that basically uh, one man is a state unto himself as we go forward. We just have to hope for the best? Yeah, we just have to hope for hope the best that because Elon we've, Musk been, we've been looking at this uh, transition of power from elected politics to billionaire for the past, I don't know, 40 years. Uh, here in France, billionaire have been buying most of the press. You have half a dozen billionaires who possess 80% of the French press and the situation in the UK and in the US is nearly the same. What we're witnessing is a multi, multi, multi-millionaire that is buying Twitter 
instead of buying the Washington Post. But, well, when Bezos bought the Washington Post, what do you think happened? The editorial policy changed in favor of Jeff Bezos. So basically, what we're going to witness right now is Elon Musk's property. Let's see what's happened, but basically it's too late. The power have been shifting from elected politics to billionaire for decades. So in my point of view, Elon Musk is a great opportunity to look at this and to ask herself, is this still a democracy? And what are we doing with our democracies? And what are we going to do now that we have people like Elon Musk, and it's the first of its kind, but certainly not the last, who plays a role that is quite similar to a state? Geopolitics and technology enabling in a war? Enabling the war in Ukraine is something huge. I mean, the United States can do this. NATO can do this. France cannot do this. We don't have enough power and weapons to enable Ukraine to make a war. We can give a little help, but nothing decisive. Elon Musk is giving something totally decisive. Without Elon Musk, there wouldn't be a war in Ukraine. Without the United States, there wouldn't be a war in Ukraine. Those are the two major players in this, in this war. I mean, on the Ukrainian side, of course. The two uh, biggest players. Russia is a big player. <coughs> but uh, on, on the NATO side, uh, the United States and Elon Musk are the two biggest are players. Are the two biggest players. This is, we've never seen this before in the, the, in the history. Fabrice Appelbois, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Kyle Spencer for being with us uh, from New York City, Alexandra Filipenko in uh, Vilnius, Connor Jewis in London. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.